Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to episode 100 of the Social Media and Politics Podcast, bringing you expert insights into how social media is changing the political game. I'm your host, Michael Bassetta, political scientist at Loon University. Remember, you can connect with the show on Twitter by following us at SMNP Podcast or visit us on the web at socialmediaandpolitics.org. All right, y'all, here we are at episode 100. <laughs> Come on, we got to mark the occasion somehow, right? Um, I do, before we get into the topic of today's episode, want to give a huge thank you to everyone who's listened, especially everyone who's shared with a friend. I didn't know what this podcast would turn into. I'm having a blast doing it. But really, the main reason I'm doing it is because it seems to provide some value uh, for you. And I really appreciate all of the tweets, messages, uh, pats on the back, basically letting me know that this is something that is interesting and that you enjoy it. So uh, I do appreciate that. And I'm uh, proud to say that we have reached the 100 episode mark. And to mark that occasion, you can leave a review on Apple Podcasts. No, I'm kidding. Uh, I have a very special guest today, and that is Dr. Tarleton Gillespie. He is a principal researcher at Microsoft Research New England and associate professor of communication at Cornell University. And I think every academic field has articles that show a mix of ingenuity, foresight, and age to become more relevant with time. And one of Dr. Gillespie's articles called The Politics of Platforms is one of those articles. It was published in 2010 in the journal New Media and Society. I'll link to it in the show notes if you want to read it. And the idea behind it, to kind of simplify it a bit, is that social media companies use the term platform as a way to discursively position themselves in strategic ways that benefit their commercial interests and also their legal standing. So the idea being platform is not a random term that's chosen, but rather that platform is kind of an amorphous term that can be invoked in strategic ways to ultimately benefit social media companies. So I thought with that article hitting its 10-year anniversary, with this podcast hitting its 100th episode, we would revisit some of the themes in that article and kind of bring it up to some of the more uh, modern debates around social media. We'll also get into some of the themes in Dr. Gillespie's latest book called Custodians of the Internet, published by Yale University Press in 2018, and try to kind of meld some of the themes between the two of them. And in doing so, we get into some pretty heady space and some interesting thoughts about social media politics and platforms. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Dr. Tarleton Gillespie. Again, he is a principal researcher at Microsoft Research New England and associate professor of communication at Cornell University. Dr. Gillespie, thanks so much for taking the time out and welcome to the Social Media and Politics podcast. Absolutely. Great to have a chance to talk to you. So before we dive into discussing your research and latest book, I'd like to start out by asking about the type of day-to-day -day work you're doing at Microsoft Research, because I think most of our academic listeners will be familiar with your research work, but it's somewhat interesting that you're studying tech companies from inside of a tech company. So can you tell us a little bit about how that works and the type of questions you and your team are asking at the Social Media Collective? Sure. Yeah, it's a great question. So I started my research at Cornell. Uh, much of the most recent book was begun before I switched over. I moved to Microsoft in 2014, temporarily in 2015, permanently. Um, Microsoft research, I think it's sometimes hard to tell from outside, is kind of a unicorn. So when you hear sort of industry-based research, you might imagine that this is either kind of you know, R&D or it's research that's academically flavored, but it's sort of directed to specific projects or, or aims of the company. And Microsoft ends up being a little different. I think they're sort of the, one of the last that's modeled after Bell Labs and IBM and Xerox, where the idea of having a, tr I'll say truly independent, it's not truly independent, but you know, as independent as possible, an academically focused organization that is academics who are doing their own research, directed by no one, um, pursuing the questions they want to pursue, that that is still beneficial to the company in some you know, slightly more tangential way, right? I'm not the one who's going to discover something that produces some million dollar product. I'm not trying to. Uh, they're really amazingly supportive of the idea of having a research group, including those of us that do kind of critical sociology, including economists, uh, a whole range, that our inquiry into the implications of technology is valuable. 
and they don't have to draw a neat line between their sense of value and mine. So my research continued pretty much exactly as it was at Cornell, with the exception that I had you know more time because I wasn't teaching and more money to get to conferences and interviews. Uh, but I continue to write books that are kind of asking hard questions about tech and society, I hope, even though, you know, at the end of my email, it says Microsoft. <laughs> right. And um, when you mentioned Bell and IBM, and I've been reading a lot about this uh, history of, of science, um, are you referring to, I don't know exactly when it was, maybe the 50s or the 60s, when these companies had these research arms with more or less free hands to researchers to do what they want in the hope that it would eventually lead to tech innovation? Yes. I mean, you you almost certainly know the history better than I do, but I, I am thinking about that, that there was a sort of commitment in the 60s about what they called at the time basic research. And what they meant was go ahead and think about computer science problems, not in the pursuit of a product or improving something by an increment, but um, solving computer science problems. And that's going to be good for the company in some way. And it's not up to the researcher to work out what that is. And I think adding to that lineage, I would say things like Intel, maybe not exactly how they are today, but there were moments like when they hired Genevieve Bell and were thinking about why anthropology might matter. I think there was a move where some of these labs said, computer science, super essential, understanding systems, understanding engineering, but there are problems that these companies are recognizing that aren't technically, or they're not going to be solved technically. And so that move to incorporate the humanities and the social sciences, Intel did some of that, and I think Microsoft did some of that. And I, I credit a lot when they hired Dana Boyd, who was kind of the first person in what we now call the social media collective. It really was a move to say, we're seeing implications in how people use these technologies, how they affect social life, how they affect democracy, how they affect public life that aren't going to be technical questions. There really are socio-technical questions in a fundamental way. And I get to be part of that lineage. Right. It's interesting. I think that model that was traditionally, you know, 50s, 60s has been kind of moved out as companies have gone public and they're sort of trying yeah. to squeeze uh, profits. But this is, podcast is not about the history of, uh, of science <laughs> and, and corporate business, but we are going to take a little bit of a historical take and particularly looking at social media platforms. And I'd like to revisit some of the arguments that you made in your 2010 article, The Politics of Platforms, before we dive into some more of your uh, recent work. And the central argument there was that even in the early days of social media, these companies selectively use the term platform for a variety of strategic purposes. And so I was wondering, for those that haven't read that article, could you kind of recap that argument for us? Yeah, absolutely. So I wrote that paper in 2009. And I think I was among a set of people in kind of sociology and communication media studies who were trying to figure out how to understand what some of us were starting to see as the power of digital intermediaries. So before we get to the word platform, it was definitely part of a mission. There were definitely other people thinking about it of saying, you know, we have media studies understandings of the power of television networks and, you know, information conglomerates. But something was different when we were looking at the landscape of the web. And I remember being in class, teaching a media studies class and talking to the students about a very traditional kind of, you know, why does it matter that Disney or, you know, Disney ABC owns the sort of mechanisms for how they produce films and television and, and all sorts of things. And they were getting it. They were getting the kind of like Marxist concern about power. And then I said, what about Google? And they said, well, Google just shows us the web. And it struck me that the way that the role of that intermediary was sort of effaced for the user, it was invisible for the at least the users I was encountering. So the first purpose of the paper was to say, how do we even think about the role that these intermediaries are playing? And at the time, I don't think we were even thinking about Facebook much. We were thinking about Google. We were thinking about early social networking, YouTube, you know, and we weren't, it seems naive now, but we weren't cognizant of the deep and complicated ways that we now see that these platforms have power, make choices, shape what people do. Then the second part is I got interested in like, how did that role become so easily invisible? What were the platforms doing that made it seem like they were simply delivering information or they were out of the way? And I have a training in sort of like humanities style. I get fascinated by the language of it. And I was noticing the word platform that was getting circulated. Platform at the time was often being used to talk about computational platforms. So, you know, the browser wars and the operating system wars and the power that an operating system has to set the terms for what software looks like. But what we were hearing was that YouTube and others were calling themselves platforms, and they kind of meant that. Like, Facebook had an API, and you could build Farmville, and <laughs> that was a computational platform. But when YouTube said it, when Facebook said it, they meant something else. It was something broader. That was my sense, anyway. 
So I looked at news coverage about where this word was showing up, and I got really fascinated in YouTube in particular because they had a really kind of rich corporate blog. This was both before and after Google purchased them, and they seemed to like the word platform. And so I got really interested in sort of what did they mean, and they seemed to mean a couple different things when they said it. The point of the paper was not the word exactly, but sort of like what Bazeman called like a discursive resting point. Like that idea of the platform was a very particular idea of like both what they were offering and how they weren't in the middle of it, how they weren't responsible for what was happening. So users were going to produce all this stuff. We were going to find all this engagement. Everyone was going to enjoy it. And the company was sort of invisible in that. But when they talked to advertisers, they were like, we can provide you the people you want to reach. We can provide you the demographics. So it was a very funny kind of like double voiced idea. On the one hand, this is a platform for you, for you to speak, for you to reach people you want to reach. We're just providing the software. And on the other hand, we can organize all this activity so that you can advertise to people and that's going to be really effective. So teasing out the word, but also kind of what the word was coming to mean, I think it did get at some of this very kind of... Um, compelling and kind of seductive position that what we now call platforms and social media of all stripes got to sort of um, settle into. Right. And it's interesting. I think it opens up a kind of box where, uh, I mean, obviously platform coming from this more computational meaning, as you said, but if we think about other terms that these platforms use just within the <laughs> platform itself, like Facebook friends, right? That's, yes. a, that's a choice that they've made. And I think, you know, at least myself, you know, logging into Facebook as a high school or college student, I wasn't thinking about what is the intent behind the word friend. And so I think that it opens up a way to think about the strategies that these companies use as a way to sort of project some things, but also to not project other things. Yeah. And if you take a, a theory of discourse that isn't uh, simplistic, like if Facebook calls it friends, we're all going to somehow think of our friends in that way, that it's not as determinist, but that when you see certain words working, right, both like the platform would like it to call it friends and trying to settle that. And when it does seem to settle in as a way to understand what it means that you each see each other's updates, which is all that really means. Um, the, I think it tells us something about both like what kind of problems they're trying to solve and how they're trying to position themselves and then how it's landing. Mm. So it's not that it sets our terms exactly, but it does tell us sort of what um, what is becoming sensible uh, and what isn't. And I think that's powerful. Definitely, definitely. And you sort of answered uh, my next question a bit, but I, I wanted to ask why specifically you focused on YouTube for the type of um, empirical work you did in that article. Yeah. Yeah. The, the paper focused on YouTube. In the more recent work, I try to look across platforms. I think that is an important instinct. At the time, YouTube was using the term kind of even more vigorously than some of the other pla of the other social media companies that were emerging. They had a really rich kind of corporate blog and public statements to draw from. And I wanted to give the article a kind of specificity. I felt like if I talked across too many companies, it would get murky. Now I think it's important that we don't just look at one platform, but at the time, they were a really useful example that I thought really teased out how important that positioning was becoming. Definitely. And I think it's it's interesting to to look back to that time period when all these platforms are emerging because yeah. I think the, the first sentence in that that article is is you note that Google purchased YouTube in 2006 for $1.65 billion, which we just learned recently from uh, Alphabet's latest earning report that YouTube is generating uh, about 10 times that in ad revenue. And so one of the things you describe both in the article and also in Custodians of the Internet is how advertisers were originally quite skeptical of turning to social media platforms out of fear that their content would be associated with the wrong users or the wrong uh, type of message. And so I'd like to ask first, what's changed since then? How were platforms able to effectively coax advertisers into buying big, into advertising on social media? Yeah, I think the advertisers, I mean, if we're going back, you know, 10, 15 years, I think advertisers were hesitant for a, a number of reasons. One had to do with what was their content, what were their advertising showing up next to? There were lots of other questions like, was it worth it? Was it worth the money? Were people actually clicking through? Was social media just a fad? Uh, who were the demographics of the users, these companies? And could they offer, I mean, this is sort of inside baseball, but could they offer the kind of data about the users that would, would match things they thought they knew about TV audiences and whatnot? So I think a couple of things have changed. One is obviously just growth, right? So the sense that you can reach more people drew advertisers a kind of legitimacy, right? So the YouTube of 2007 is quite different than the YouTube today. 
in part because it's YouTube. It has authority. We know who goes there. It's not going to disappear tomorrow. Then I think there's a, this question that emerged about not wanting your ads to show up next to something really unpleasant. And in a weird way, I think the platforms actually made it safer for advertisers than the web did. Because if you were pushing advertising through sort of Google's AdWords program, your ads could be showing up on any old website. And it was hard initially for them to assure that those ads were showing up next to something they wanted showing up. They were just selling it according to what terms or sort of what demographics. And the platforms, especially Facebook, could show more who it was actually going in front of. And that's turned into two pieces. One is the incredible ability to target. So this makes it very appealing for an advertiser, whether it's commercial advertising or political, to know that they're reaching a very specific demographic, a specific location, people interested in certain kinds of things. And with that, the promise, whether they meet this promise or not, that they know which content you don't want to be next to, right? So you might find a demographic, you want young men 25 to 34 interested in politics, but you don't want, you know, a sort of like clash of alt-right discussants. And to the degree that the platforms can say they can tell the difference, advertisers want that reassurance. Definitely. And I mean, I think the targeting and the data is a big factor there uh, in terms of alleviating advertisers' concerns. But Around the same time, you had the Obama 2008 campaign, right, which was seen as, at least today, is seen as this uh, great success story in using social media. And particularly, if you look at their YouTube channel, it's a lot of videos that they filmed of regular citizens with a Obama t-shirt and um, you know, talk about why they support the candidate on the YouTube channel. So how do you see that early adoption of social media platforms by sort of commercial advertisers versus political campaigns? Because I think that same risk of being associated with the wrong content or maybe not buying into the platform could be even worse for political campaigns. Yeah, I, th I think that's right. I mean, I think the risk is greater. We probably have to then think about why the appeal is greater too. You can imagine, I mean, I think that we often say like, oh, a lot of these media are first explored by porn. I, I think politics is in there too. I think that if you're a, you know, a small scrappy campaign and you don't have the money for a massive television buy, maybe looking for other, you know, routes is appealing. It makes a whole lot of sense about why social media would look appealing on first blanche because I think for a lot of other media forms, you have to trade off between reach and intimacy. So you can send your candidate to each town and maybe they're going to you know, shake hands and they're going to speak at the town hall and they're going to actually have contact, but they're going to contact very few people and it's an incredible expense of resources. Or you can advertise on mass media if you can afford it, but how connected is it? How much are you addressing someone? So that tension between reach and intimacy, social media promised to kind of do both, right? It would feel intimate because you're being addressed and you're being addressed in the midst of who you are on your profile, who your community is. And it could get to a potential number of people, especially with the kind of promise or myth of virality, right? Maybe something's going to go uh, like gangbusters. Um, so it makes sense to me that on the one hand, it would be risky. You know, maybe social media is a flash in the pan. Maybe it's a waste of money. On the other hand, it might look like something really promising. And I'm drawing a little bit on Foote and Schneider's book about web campaigning, but it's important to remember that campaigns are doing a lot of things, right? If you're a commercial advertiser and you want more people to know about your particular brand of chips, that's one thing. But if you need to both advertise your candidate and change thinking about issues and fundraise and gather grassroots activity, a lot of those things can happen in these web environments if it works. So I get the appeal about why that medium seemed suited to political campaigning. Then we face this problem as we get these circulatory networks where an ad goes into Facebook or into Twitter and then you hope it gets passed around or it gets taken up and sort of you know retweeted. Then you've got this new question about, well, who is it being associated with when it's being circulated and how much control can you have as a campaign or as a platform in that at all? And I think that risk has grown more challenging in the last few years. Yeah, and it's it's interesting. I, I think definitely who's circulating the content. So far we've been talking about, you know, advertisers coming in from the top down, usually getting a sort of um 
I don't know, special treatment's the right word, but using a different range of tools than the average user does. So that's kind of a top-down content to the user. But then there's also the users who are creating content themselves from the bottom up. And right. that's something we haven't really discussed, but I think it's something that you look at in Custodians of the Internet, where you talk at first about you know this idea of the kind of free and open web. I think mostly, at least in this podcast, we've been talking about the days of blogs. Um, and as social media platforms have grown, we've seen more uh, platformization where the interactions take place within these kind of uh, walled gardens. And so what you argue in Custodians is that the main commodity that these platforms actually offer is content moderation. And I was wondering if you could just kind of relay that argument to the uh, the listeners. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, the, the aim of the book, and it was a, a while in writing, so of course, like the, the landscape about thinking about content moderation changed quite a bit. But in some ways, the the initial point of the book was to highlight that moderation was happening at all. I, f- I felt like when I started the book and even when it came out, there was still a sense of like, you could go through Facebook as a user and be unaware, practically unaware of the fact that there are rules, the fact that things get taken down, the fact there's a whole mechanism behind the platform that's functioning to sort of sort out pornography and harassment and violence and all these things. And so the ability, it goes back in some ways to the 2010 article, the ability for platforms to appear as if they're sort of frictionless and bounteous and it's just a way to connect with people requires facing all of that stuff. And yet it struck me as saying, you know, what is a platform, what is a platform differently than just the web, right? What was the platform offering both in the early days and even now that makes it different than just being online? And to me, it was sort of like, you're going to have a better experience. Well, now we have to unpack what better means. Sometimes that means more organized. That was sort of YouTube's logic, right? There's video everywhere, but you can't find it. It's all different formats, and we're going to put it together. Sometimes it's about finding your people, right? This is sort of Facebook's offer and Twitter's offer about connecting and building and finding community and creating these circuits of network. Sometimes it's about voice. You're going to get to more people. But I think it also had to do with, like, it's not going to be just, you know, flooded with porn and abuse like the web was right you had to deal with the web if you were going to live in the free and open web you had to deal with there were pockets of junk and there was so much porn and everything was scattered all over and part of that promise when you say come to youtube or come to instagram is everything you find there is going to be amazing it's going to be what you want and as soon as you say like what you want and not what you don't you're doing two things you're selecting for and you're selecting out So the curation is part of it. Like, do the recommendations give me videos I want? Does the front page of the site look like something I want to spend time on? And the selecting out is it's not going to be a bunch of junk. It's not going to be spam. It's not going to be porn. It's not going to be abuse. It's not going to be stupid. It's not going to be, you know, ranting and raving. That instinct is like core. It's not extra. It's core to the offerings. We couldn't see it as users and we couldn't see it as the public very well um, until we really heard how much the problems persisted and we learned how much these companies do right like now when i say it's a commodity i don't just mean it's central to the offer it's like a big part of the business it's thousands of people it's an incredible investment it shapes what features they pursue and which ones they don't it employs people all over the world like when you say what is facebook or what is youtube a big piece of that now includes who is sorting through and deciding what has to come off yeah, it's interesting. I'm thinking um, the time when the book came out, content moderation was really on the, the public agenda at the time with Russian disinformation and things like that. Um, but I'm thinking about your, what you were saying that you sort of know what you're getting when you sign up for a, a platform. You're kind of getting away from all of that porn and the craziness of the web. But now we see interesting phenomenon where we have platforms that are emerging that essentially promise non-moderation, right? Platforms like Gab or different forms of user-generated moderation like Minds. And so I'm wondering how you see that where there's new services emerging that promise not to moderate, but to an extent, moderation is part and parcel of being a platform. Yeah, yeah. It's a great question. I, I find myself wanting to hold on to the idea that all of those sites are moderated. It's a question of, what that moderation looks like, where it draws its lines, and how it does it. So there's two ways of thinking about that. One is to say, 
the cheater way is to say no moderation is a choice about moderation, right? That's one way to get out of the cycle. If you say, hey, come one, come all, we're going to allow the racists and the hate and the whatever, and you're just going to deal with it, and that's what this place is about, that's a promise about moderation. It's a promise to say you've got to know what you're getting here. The other way to make this move is to say they still take down child pornography and they still take down spam right? Because they have to or because they want to. Those look like no moderation. Of course, removing spam is moderation. It's just that no one's really disputing it. And removing child pornography is moderation. It's just that no one thinks you shouldn't. So those have become so naturalized that we don't even think about them as moderation anymore. But they are the removal of categories of activity because they're perceived to be unacceptable in either a sort of moral, ethical, cultural sense or a self-preserving platform sense, right? No one's going to want to be here if it's full of spam. No one's going to want to be here if it has child pornography. No one's going to want to be here if they can't, you know, avoid getting harassed. So even Gab removes, you know, child pornography because they're obliged to. So instead, I would say you're, there isn't a platform without moderation, even if the choice is we're going to proclaim that we won't take down certain kinds of things. That's just saying we're going to be quite different than Twitter or Instagram or, or whatever. Now, the other the other way to answer is to say, yes, we have to think about a landscape of platforms that do this differently. They do it differently in part because they draw different lines in the sand. What counts as harassment? Is this, are threats okay? Is pornography okay? They do it differently in terms of where they put the decision-making, the mechanism. So is this a team behind the scenes that looks for it? Is this software that flags things and someone reviews it? Is it a community structure like a Reddit or Wikipedia where there's sort of volunteers that are doing a lot of it and it sort of can be escalated? And a lot of the platforms have sort of combinations, you know, different sort of mixes of those. Um, and then the last is that it differs by sort of scale and mechanism. So if we're going to review our site, but it can be you and I looking at 10 posts an hour, that's very different than saying we're going to review the site and we need 15,000 people on a constant loop making decisions every 10 seconds. Mm. And I have a question. It's, it's similar to what we're, we're, we were just talking about. And sure. it's it's about when we hear the concept content moderation, you know, especially with the way that these big controversies are covered in the press. Like, does Facebook take down this Dr. Nancy Pelosi video or not? Those are kind of big events that everyone kind of hears about. And moderation is also the removal of content, what's allowed to stay on. But I'm thinking more about these like tweaks to certain algorithms. Like, how does Facebook decide what signals to prioritize in its algorithm. This is a much more subtle form of moderating content. And so do you think these kind of small algorithmic decisions play a bigger role than some of these major controversies that reverberate in the news? Yeah, Yeah. that's a great question. And it's in some ways kind of the fundamental question. When I started thinking about this, I thought that controversies were a really good signal, right? Because when someone says, I can't believe this site took down my content, they're asserting that wherever the line was drawn, it was unjustified, right? And so it tells you something about like, well, not everybody agrees with this kind of mechanism, right? This is making political, small p political judgments among people's speech that isn't necessarily consensus agreed upon. So I focused on controversies. And then in some ways, the public attention as it grew also focused on controversies. So that's Gamergate and that's you know, stolen celebrity nudes, and that's the Christchurch shooting, and that's the 2016 election. And so we often have a kind of flare-up quality where we freak out about deep fakes or we freak out about, and it's not unjustified, but it's shaped by that attention. So you're right to say, okay, there's another layer of things that might count as moderation that are not as dramatic as does Alex Jones get kicked off the service. It's much more built into the functioning of the site, and it's much more mundane and much harder to see. I want to go to an even deeper level, which is to say, we have to shed the idea that these intermediaries are anything other than structuring our activity, (laughs) right? We love the idea that these things are conduits, right? I can call you on the phone and my information travels. And I was free to do that. And there was just a mechanism that got it there. Or someone made a, you know, an album and then a mechanism like deliver those to stores or onto websites. And then I got to listen to it. And and we know full well from sort of the history of media and, and information technology that how you design the site, how you structure it, who comes to it, what gets taken up there, how it gets policed, how it grows, what its competition looks like, what happens when it's political, what happens when it's crucial, you know, during emergencies. There are all these moments that kind of like all these little adjustments 
where does this feature go? What's the edge of what's limited here? How does something get prioritized or deprioritized? Those are all shaping what ends up happening there. Now, some of it may be relatively inconsequential shaping, right? It's fine. Some of it may be deeply inequitable. Some of it may have massive political consequences. Some may not. So moderation, both in the most dramatic sense, right? Who's suspended? Who's kicked off? What's deleted? A second tier, which is adjustments about what gets prioritized and circulated and to whom and under what conditions. And then at like a deepest level, like how it even functions, how it's built, what people made of it, how it's made sense. Now, the key, I think, in that middle part of the question you're asking is when choices are made on why to circulate, did I see your Facebook post? You know, was that a calculation about engagement, about how strong a bond the site thinks you and I have? How interested am I going to be? Does it fit a sort of advertising logic? Um, if that decision also includes this is problematic content, and so part of the decision to circulate or not circulate it is not just engagement or relevance, it's also appropriateness, right? It adds a feature. Those are all judgments, right? Relevance is a judgment. Interest is a judgment, but unacceptability for whom and for what reason is a judgment too. And I think that the next wave of studying content moderation has to focus on that kind of built-in, mundane, sort of who finds themselves on the wrong side of these decisions, who finds themselves um, not enjoying a certain circulation that they might otherwise enjoy, but with not a naive sense that like we know what unfettered circulation looks like. Because what counts as acceptable circulation is already a product of how Facebook works, how Twitter works, how YouTube's algorithm works. We can't judge it free of that, which makes it like incredibly precarious. When, you, when people say, oh, there's conservative bias, I think that's a tactical claim. But it's tactical because it's very hard to refute. Because mm. what counts as not biased in this weird, targeted, circulated, personalized mega network, we don't know what counts as this is what circulation should be, and then someone is someone's tweaking the levers for the wrong reasons. We have to judge whether they're tweaking the levers for the wrong reasons when we don't even know what untweaked is. Right, because there's no counterfactual. There's no um, ideal world of free circulation. There's never been a platform that, in fact, maybe there can't be a platform that could allow for such circulation because the rules need to be defined somehow yeah. to deal with the amount of content. And, and we can say the same thing about other media. We can say, like, what is appropriate news coverage in a newspaper environment, right? We're only judging it based on sort of how certain forms came to look like news, and then we judge violations of that, when in fact what counts as news has never been stable. It's always been a product of attempts to make news and attempts to – make judgments about what the public needs, right? All in an environment where money's being made and institutions arise and, you know, different sort of political circumstances press on these things. There is no unadjusted. There's just moving towards something that we think is valuable and, and noticing when we're moving away from it. Right. Now we're getting into different different modalities. Um, yes. But, but let's go – I want to return to that third layer you were talking about, this deepest layer. You were mentioning how, um, if I got you correctly, these type of different – feature placements or um, the the way that these platforms are constructed can, can shape our behavior. And I want to ask if you think that because of how popular these platforms have become, because of how much time people are spending on them, do you think that whatever layer of this content moderation can actually exert a force on social norms more broadly? Hmm. Right. I'm thinking maybe – if you had something like a, a concrete example would be, has the way that WhatsApp's design, let's say group chats. Do group chats influence how we actually might interact at a level of, you know, one-to-one -one because we have this in our back of our head, the way that, I don't know, it, it gets it gets tough to think, can there be a, a feature or a certain uh, protocol of a platform that actually exerts a force beyond the individual? Yeah, I mean this is this is like a fundamental question to thinking about kind of sociology and communication and it's incredibly hard question to tease out. So, I mean, I can just say a couple things that don't fully answer the question, but it's such an intriguing question. I mean, one is to say we often worry about how will a specific kind of mediated communication like a group chat or a Facebook news feed how is that going to have an effect on 
other kinds of communication. And in some ways, as we could say, like, it kind of doesn't matter because it's like people are communicating through group chat, right? So if it shapes communication, it's already shaping it somewhere. So the, the main question is not, is it going to turn us into that in every circumstance? But what does it mean that it is being explored, it is being taken up, and it does have specific contours that are hard to identify and are sometimes obscured in the promises of whatever it is, unfettered communication or perfect community or you know broadcastability. Those little nuancy changes already matter for the platform in which people are congregating and are getting information. They matter because the next platform that is emerging will be modeling themselves after that or competing with it and trying to be different. So it's already shaping the next wave. But I get the point where it's like, you know, for instance, is our sensibility about privacy changing because of sort of the ways we can and can't govern our privacy in, in online communities right. or, or is our sense of turn taking or civility or, you know, the, the room you have to play with your political stance versus how much you have to present yourself as what you believe in. I think the it's too easy to say the jury's out, but I do think that like, it would be naive of us to think that it doesn't. And it would be simplistic to imagine that it simply makes us different. And the place I land is like, of course it changes things. And that's partly why we why we do explore these new media because they offer something. And I don't mean like it's whatever users make of it. I mean, um, if this way of being social or this way of being political or this way of being private or not private were not intriguing and, and opportunity offering, I don't know if it would have exploded and grown in the way it has barring like of course where investment happens makes certain things happen i don't mean it's just driven by what users want but i mean it has to resonate or else it doesn't matter how much you want it to succeed and then we have this question of like as things get more established and they're around and generations of people kind of emerge and facebook just is the landscape in which political communication happens we don't have any memory of it being any different um i do think there is a power to those kind of very subtle logics I think that's part of what even the the paper about platforms is trying to get at is like we're settling into a notion of the kind of logic of the platform. And that's more than just what it is and what it says it is. It's like all the subtle kind of tacit ways that things kind of seem to be. I do think that matters beyond does it shape what you get to do on that platform in any one particular instance. Definitely. It's interesting to, to think about, but let's let's dig back uh, closer up to the surface here and talk about um, content moderation in a more concrete form, uh, or at least one that's you know easier to uh, to digest. And, and that's the decisions made to remove content. And you break down three different ones in the book. And, and one is full editorial control. That's top-down decisions to remove something uh, when users flag content to be reviewed, and then also automated systems that are increasingly becoming sophisticated to uh, to remove content. And I think your call at the end of the book is for platforms to share more responsibility with users in deciding how content should be moderated, kind of at a more uh, bargaining or normative level than, than we currently have today. So can you outline that argument for why users should be more involved in that decision-making process and which platform comes closest to the ideal model? Yeah. So there's a certain liberty when you write a book where the last chapter you get to say, here are my suggestions, and you get to untether them from anything like, are these viable or ever going to happen? <laughs> so I'll say that as a caveat. Um, but But I think that you know, one of the things that happens is as we spend more time with the platforms that we actually use, we get into these very particular debates about what they should have done with the Christchurch video or what should happen with pornography or what's working, what's not, should we have this law or that law? We start to lose our ability to ask bigger questions about how it could be different, right? Because we're looking to like, could we improve it here? Could we make an obligation there? And those are all very well-intentioned and important, but it, it starts to settle in like, well, this is how it's done. And part of what I was trying to do was to say, like, look, this is how it's done, but it doesn't have to be that way. And these platforms have built up these combinations of these different mechanisms you mentioned. So identification by the platform sometimes, review by the platform. How did they identify it? Was it users calling attention to things and there's problems with that? Was it software that was designed to identify something that's pornographic or harassing? There's problems with that. And then these kind of workflows about how many people are doing this work and who's looking at it and how do judgments get made? 
what I wanted to call attention to is that by and large, most of the platforms we're talking about, the Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram world, still have what I tried to call a customer service model. So however they were going to find out about it, maybe you flagged it, right? Someone's harassing you or you bumped into something offensive. You flag it and the platform says, got it. I hear you're complaining. I'm going to take care of it, right? Which means all the judgment is sort of reserved behind the scenes, whether it's software or a team of 10 or a team of 10,000. And to me, it's like, that's better than nothing, but it certainly leaves us like, no matter how thoughtful you are, no matter how careful you are, that's still the platform saying we can make a judgment on behalf of the users about stuff that is really contentious. Like, yeah, there's the stuff that's barbaric and kind of no one wants to see it, but there's an awful lot of stuff that's right on the edge. Like, is this political debate or is this harassment? Is this pornographic or is it artistic sexual expression? Is this being fair to different communities and different value judgments, or is it kind of running afoul of it? And it's not surprising that a small group of people trying to set rules quickly for their own benefit, maybe in the user's best interest, but which user do they even know, is going to be a very limited way to manage what I think are kind of like not just tricky issues, but they're unanswerable issues, except the community has to have the discussion, right? We have to have the debate. I, the one I think about is like, should a newspaper show coffins coming back from battle, right? And we answer that question differently all the time. And when a newspaper decides to do it, we have this debate like, dear God, is that the right thing to do? Is that horrific? Is that help us understand the cost? Is it cruel to the families? There's no answer. There's no right answer to that. There's only the answer the culture comes up with again and again and again. So if what the platforms are doing is they're going to kind of handle that for us, it doesn't matter how great they are about it. It's still the wrong place to make that decision. And God forbid, they don't do it very well very often, right? So we've got two problems. So in the book, I sort of say, you know, we ask users to flag things and we give individual users tools to block people and to sort of get away from, you know, harassment or whatever to some degree. But we don't leave any of that decision making to communities very often, to groups of people who are actually the stakeholders in a conversation, in like what's going on, right? Now, the places that do do that are places that are built on a very different model, a kind of online community model. And in some ways, it pains me to say this, but in some ways, like Reddit is closer to this, where they hand a lot of the moderation over to moderators who are in charge of subreddits. Now, this is by no means a perfect arrangement, but what it does do is say, if there's a sense of community, and if that can actually feel true, then the people who are helping to make the decision that something is unacceptable are part of the community, they're accountable to the community, they've been there, they're invested in what the community is trying to be. And you know that can go horribly wrong. Like What that doesn't handle is when an entire community wants to be awful, including the moderators, and that's when a platform kind of still has to intervene. Like If they're like, we'll circulate child pornography, we have no problem with this, then it still falls to Reddit to do something about that. But what I think it gets closer to is these communities have to be in a position to assert some responsibility and capacity to manage themselves. And that some of the mediation, some of the decision-making has to fall to that community. Now, there are all sorts of problems with that. Like, I'm not saying users should have to look at beheading videos, but it may be that the balance of kind of where the worst goes, what software can handle, but how do you leave more of the decision to users when that is going to strengthen the community or strengthen the faith in the judgment rather than saying, don't worry, you're going to love being here. We're going to handle all the bad stuff. I think that ends up being the wrong instinct, but that's a very hard thing to imagine switching over to. That's a, that's a pie in the sky idea, given that we're so now embedded into the platforms that built themselves the way they do, they moderate the way they do, and we sure want them to do it better. Let's demand they do it better. It leaves it harder to say, God, what would a different system look like? Yeah, which gets back to the the point we were talking about earlier of the moderation being the commodity that the the platforms offer. Right. Um, I was thinking, you know, as I was reading the book, I was thinking about Reddit as the prime example uh, or a different example. Uh, we had a guy from uh, a moderator from the Donald on a few episodes ago, where he sort of revealed that in that case they have their own moderators, but they did have representatives from the platform have to step in and start taking measures. Yep. So that's interesting. I was 
thinking a little bit deeply about it. And what about Wikipedia? I was thinking that might be more of the closest model because you don't have the subdivided communities, but it is very decentralized open source. I saw someone posting on Twitter about how most of the moderators are male, so there's a bias there. But how do you feel about that platform? To me, that seems the most open, decentralized, at least in terms of the major ones. Yeah. And certainly Wikipedia is is a model we need to think about more. Um, and you're right that Wikipedia is not without its problems. And the question of sort of who's making decisions is not a solved problem, but it does a lot of things right where it's incredibly committed to transparency. So you can see where decisions are made. You can have a space to debate whether it was the right decision. You can weigh in. There are tools to undo decisions and that's visible. So that commitment to transparency is really important. It creates a possibility for accountability. It's also built up, very importantly, a sense of commitment, right? If you're a, an admin, you're not just committed to like, you've been asked to do three hours a week, you're committed to the success of the site and its principles. And that's a hard thing to build up and they very successfully built that. I think there's two things that we have to keep in mind. One, it's really telling that Wikipedia is nonprofit. <laughs> I, I don't think that's unrelated to that question um, because they can make decisions about how to privilege the aims of the site and not have that struggle with growth at all costs or the needs of advertisers or the demand to collect data. And we'd have to tease out exactly how those shape moderation decisions. I don't want it to make it an easy you know, sort of criticism, but I, it's telling. But the second thing is that I think that one of the reasons why people can manage Wikipedia disputes and disagreements and misuse relatively effectively is that Wikipedia is a site that has a clear and understood purpose. I mean, at the most fundamental level, right? It isn't a place to chat. It's a place to build an encyclopedia in a very particular way. And a lot of the moderation isn't about profanity and violence. It's about, is this the encyclopedia we want? Is this clear? Is this cited? Is this neutral point of view? And, and in that is also vandalism doesn't help us. Harassment doesn't help us. It's better to make a rule against pornography, and we're going to articulate and debate that. And, and I think one of the things that the major social media platforms struggle with is that they try to be purposeless. So Facebook isn't trying to be a specific thing. It's trying to be everything. This is where you chat. This is where you keep up with people. This is where you get informed. This is where you have fun. This is where you go crazy. This is where you, you know, everything. And so the moderation can only be, this shouldn't be here because we say so, or this shouldn't be here because it's illegal, or this shouldn't be here because it's just wrong. And there's no attachment to, what are we trying to make here? Are we moderating in the service of something we all kind of agree on? Reddit's a little closer to that, and game worlds are a little closer to that, where you can say, yeah, we got to deal with people saying trashy things. But if it becomes a place where Nazis rally, it isn't a game world anymore. It isn't Wikipedia anymore. So it's perfectly justifiable to kick people off the platform. And the big social media companies don't have that to fall back on, not nearly as clearly as a Wikipedia or a game world or a site that has a, an idea of what it's trying to generate. Yeah, it's, it's super interesting. Um, now, this is a bit of a, an oddball question, but I wanted to ask you about the uh, the dark web because on the dark web, you have very little platformization and instead the kind of interaction among users is tend to be driven by uh, you know the exchange of illicit goods, whether that's drugs or child pornography, whatever. So I guess the question is, what happens when content moderation is completely stripped from the equation? Yeah, I mean, I think in, in a weird way, some of the dark web sites are an example of why purpose guides moderation, right? If you want to be Gab or you want to be Silk Road, you do have a purpose. That purpose is this is where all the hate's going to be that can't live on Twitter. Um, we're going to have a conversation where hate is the norm as opposed to the thing that's being extinguished. Or we're going to go ahead and sell illicit goods, and and that's what we're here for. And so at least the moderation or the relative lack of, of intervention is in line with the purpose, right? That purpose just may be a, a principled one or it may be a practical one. The other thing that I think is probably more important is to say we're worried about is Twitter getting this right? Is Facebook getting this right? Is Instagram getting this right? What we really care about is what does the whole ecosystem make possible? And if we push you know, neo-Nazism out of Twitter, it doesn't just disappear it finds another place to be. 
And then we have this harder question about both like what we can't dream that there's going to be no hateful ideology. That's sort of going to lead us down a primrose path. What kind of ecological environment are we okay with where kind of high visibility central places allow certain kinds of things and don't allow others pockets of activity allow certain things and others whose job is it to go after those things is that the site is that police is that uh, it's a release valve and i don't know we have the answers to that but we do know that when we press down somewhere something else emerges so these questions about ecosystem both kind of what do we want as a public and also what would it even mean to try to make that happen through law or through intervention is a very hard question and you know, i can imagine some people saying the dark web is kind of like it's better if it's just there right police can find the truly awful stuff people who don't want to be any part of it can avoid it and it's never going to go away so these kind of pockets are sort of the best we can hope for and other people saying that's just a mechanism to manage to circulate hate and violence until it erupts on the land or in facebook full form and, and that's a really hard debate including practically what do you imagine doing about it um, that's the debate that we face after we discuss how's Facebook doing this, how's Twitter doing this, could they do it better? Right, definitely. And um, kind of keeping in this idea of, of speech, I have one last question for you, and I want to kind of preface it with the Senate hearings in 2017 after all of the Russian disinformation uh, scandal, where you had the representatives from Facebook, Twitter, and and Google talking about how they're going to create more industry wide standards. They're going to be um, you know sharing more information and common approaches to combating disinformation and and quote unquote bad actors. But I think this election has really shown with policies around political ads that these platforms are all taking different directions, right? Twitter's banning them, Facebook's allowing verifiably false ads to run on the platforms. Um, so bringing this idea of political speech and, and the, the promise to collaborate more actually seems to be kind of scattering out. And so what I wanted to ask is heading into the 2020 election, how do you see the impact of politics on the politics of platforms? Yeah, yeah. I, something really changed in 2016 at least in the U.S., about um, the concern about the role of platforms, which is moderation partly, uh, and all sorts of other questions, in in part because you know the threat to democracy is a much sort of a much easier thing to get behind than the concerns of marginalized communities who might be left out or unfairly squeezed. That's unfortunate, but that's the case, right? Like journalists like that story. It's affecting everybody. It's about democracy. It's kind of a big public obligation. Um, and, and it, you know, the sense of importance landed bigger than it did, for instance, with Gamergate, which is a huge problem, but that was only some women who were experiencing that. And it's sad that that couldn't generate the same set of concerns that the 2016 election and the question about misinformation did. But it has, and it has driven a, an opening, both an attention from regulators, um, a change in how the biggest companies talked about this, which until about 2016, they really liked to not talk about it. And I think after 2016, especially with the way that Mark Zuckerberg was initially dismissive and how flat-footed that sounded, the it has changed their willingness to talk at least to some degree and come to these meetings and speak before Congress and come to academic conferences about how moderation might work and how misinformation is is functioning. Um, and, and I think that uh, that's probably good, right? The sort of like the power of that lever is good. It's opened up both the question of moderation in particular and these kind of broader questions about how moderation functions, how it's tangled with the economics of platforms, the commitment to data, the privacy questions, like it really has begun to peel open a whole set of discussions about if social media are one of, if not the central mechanism by which the public informs itself about its candidates, about its political process, about news, and talks to itself and, and about these issues. And that is creating an environment that is deeply problematic and easily weaponizable and and easy to obscure things like fact and consensus. Um, we're at least pulling open the question of like, what is that logic that's settled in? What is that sensibility of platforms? And to me, what a platform was was never software. It was a very particular idea of role and responsibility. What are users doing? What are content providers doing? What is the platform doing? 
and who manages it when that becomes a problem. And that idea, that logic of what the platform was and was not got powerfully settled in the days where social media was exciting, it was growing, it seemed to, you know, like just be beneficial. It was part of democracy and the wellspring of revolutions. And now we can see it with a little bit more clarity. What I would say is that we have an opportunity to really say, what must that platform logic be if it's also going to be a healthy mechanism for the democratic process? And if we look at our history about media information, we know that there's a new challenge here, which is an industry that says there's no problem becomes seen as a problem can be called to task. The next problem is that it will circle its wagons, look for the least intrusive regulation, agree to that regulation, and normalize its underlying functioning. And so while we have an opportunity to say some of this is unacceptable and we need something to be different, whatever we settle into is going to settle in powerfully. And if we don't really challenge the question of the entirety of the ecosystem, right? Not just the platforms, but the dark web. The question of moderation, not just through the controversy and the big examples, but the mundane and the design and the everyday and the all the time. Um, the different forms of platforms, the biggest sort of general purpose ones, the community driven ones, the smaller ones, the alternative ones. If we don't address that and the connection between content and data, both like what gets recommended and taken away and how does that connect to a business model that needs people engaging. That all has to be on the table. And we have a chance to say all of this has to be healthier and we have to have a debate about it. But there's going to be incredible effort to say, we see the problem, we got it, give us some light regulation and we're all going to be good. And whatever that settles into, I think is becomes very powerful and hard to challenge later on. Hmm. We'll see if history repeats itself or if we learn <laughs> from history. Uh, Dr. Gillespie, this has been super fascinating and super fun. Thanks so much for taking the time out and sharing your insights with us. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. Great talking to you. I've just been speaking with Dr. Tarleton Gillespie, Principal Researcher at Microsoft Research New England and Associate Professor of Communication at Cornell University. And that's a wrap for this episode of the Social Media and Politics Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. Next episode is going to be an interesting follow-up to this one. I'll be speaking with Craig Stadler. He's the founder and CEO of PDVid, which is kind of a competitor to YouTube. And I'll be sure to ask him how he moderates content. But until then, I'm your host, Michael Bassetta, signing off from Malibu. See you next time. <laughs>